Let us pray. God, open our ears to hear your word. Open our hearts to receive your word. Open our eyes to see your hand at work in the world around us. And open our lives to the infinite possibilities born of your love. Amen. Our gospel lesson today might well be one of the most familiar texts in all of the gospels. It's the story that we have come to know as the story of the Good Samaritan. The context for this story is set immediately as it begins. A lawyer has come to Jesus to test him. Now, Lawyers tend to be those folks who are the keepers of the law. They understand all the law. And so when the lawyer asks Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life, we're almost imagining that this lawyer knows what the answer is long before the question comes out of his mouth. But he asks. And Jesus says, you're the lawyer, don't you know? What do you read in the scriptures? What do you read in the commandments? What does it say? Love the Lord my God with all my heart and with all my mind and with all my strength and love my neighbor as myself. Okay, you got the right answer. One more question, Jesus, while I'm asking exactly who is this neighbor of mine? that I am supposed to love as myself. Who is that? I'm going to venture a guess that the lawyer was not prepared for the answer that Jesus gives him. Not at all. Because we're introduced to four characters, an injured man and three people who happen to come upon him. Now, If I'm the lawyer standing there, I am going to immediately be thinking as I'm listening to this story unfolding from Jesus that these first two folks that I meet up with, this priest and this Levite, these holy, holy men, surely they're going to do something. They're going to go find somebody if they're not going to do something. These holy men, they're not just going to leave him lying on the road. But not only do they leave him lying on the road, they cross over so they don't have to be too close to him. And then comes the wrinkle in the story. Then comes what has to be the most disturbing moment for this lawyer, because up comes this Samaritan guy. Well now, context means a lot. We have to understand what it means to be a Samaritan among Jews in the first century world because a Samaritan was a hated person. This was an Assyrian half-breed. So you Jewish people during the diaspora, when you went off and lived in all those places and married those Assyrians that you weren't supposed to marry because didn't the law tell you you weren't supposed to do that? And then you come back with them as a family. Well, no, see, no, you are not us. And so there's great hatred among these folks. There's great hatred between Jews and Samaritans. There's no love lost between any of these folks. So this lawyer may well have been insulted when Jesus would suggest that of all the people that could come upon this man, a Samaritan of all people, you got to be kidding me, they would not help. That would not be the person who would stop and help. Surely not, because we all know about them. They wouldn't do that. But that's not the story that Jesus tells. 
this unlikely person, this person who is at great personal risk himself, because not only could he have been wounded himself going to try to help, but this guy could have looked up and even in his injured state and said, get away from me. You can't touch me. You can't even be here. There's a lot of risk to this Samaritan stopping to help the injured man. And we wonder what the lawyer is thinking, and we wonder what everybody else around is thinking as Jesus tells this story. Because are they thinking this is insane? This is ridiculous? This could never happen? Or is there even some slight possibility that they're thinking in their minds, could that really be? Could it be that a Samaritan could have mercy on my soul? Could it be that what I've thought about Samaritans forever really might not be true? I want to take you for a few minutes to a day in World War II particular day, December 20th, 1943. A squadron of American pilots were flying over Germany in a mission, doing what they were instructed to do. They had targets over Bremen. They were there to hit their targets and to leave. And things had been going well at the beginning of that mission. They found their targets. The bombers were dropping their bombs. And as they were circling and beginning to leave the area, they came under attack by German aircraft. Most of the squadron was able to get away, but there was a pilot named Charles Brown. And Charles and his folks' plane got hit, and it got hurt. It was damaged very badly. His gunner was no longer able to shoot. They had become defenseless. They were down to one engine, lost altitude, lost speed. They were dropping fast. And his only hope was if they could get out of German airspace and get to some place where they could land, they might live. And in an instant, he looked around and realized that a German fighter plane was coming up on him, and it was coming up on him fast. And he knew he had no way to escape that. He couldn't do anything. Now, the guy who was flying that German fighter plane was a guy by the name of Franz Stiegler. Stiegler was a highly commended pilot for Germany, well-decorated. He had lost a brother to the Allied forces, and so if there were anybody that had a moment to exact some revenge and a reason to do so, well, it was him. this plane in his sights, and this could be it. But as he closed in on the plane, he realized something. He realized that this plane was defenseless. He could see that the gunner couldn't shoot, that nobody could do anything, that this plane was barely limping along. He could see that. And so he had a choice to make in a very quick window. He could do his job, and he could finish it off. Or he could make another choice. If he were found 
should have allowed an enemy plane to escape. He knew he'd at best be court-martialed, at worst he'd be executed on sight. But he was not going to shoot down that defenseless plane and its crew. So instead, he pulled into formation along to Charles Brown's plane to help camouflage it from any other German planes. And he escorted him out of German airspace so that that crew could get away. And as they reached the end of German airspace and he felt that they were safe, he saluted them and turned around and flew away. Charles Brown and his crew managed to get to safety. He managed to land that disabled plane. They managed to walk away. And years later, as he was recounting this story, everyone laughed at him and said he was just making up some fanciful tale because surely no German person would have let him get away. That's the craziest thing we've ever heard. Everybody laughed at him. What kind of crazy tale is this, that some German pilot lets you get away? Well, years passed, and he was giving an interview to a military magazine. And as he was giving the interview, he broke down and he said, I'm alive today because this guy let me live. He stayed with me, got me out of German airspace, got me to safety before he left. And he saluted me as he took off. By this time, Franz Stiegler is living in Canada, a businessman. He reads the interview and he reaches out to this man that he's not seen in 57 years. And he said, it's me. It's me. Well, Charles Brown couldn't wait to see him because he said, thank you is not enough. I wouldn't be alive today. I wouldn't have a family. I wouldn't have anything. Had you not let me get away that day. You showed me mercy. You showed me mercy. And for Franz Stiegler, there was another piece to that story. He gave Charles Brown a book, and in the inscription that he wrote in the book was that this man's life that he had been able to save made him his brother. He hadn't been able to save his own brother but he'd been able to save him. Jesus tells a lawyer, go out and show mercy. Show mercy to the person who may be least likely to show mercy to you. Show mercy to the person who may hate you who may revile you. Show mercy to the person who may, in the moment before, have tried to take your life. It doesn't matter. Show mercy even to the one who hates you. Those are hard words for us to hear. Those are hard, hard words for us to hear. The night before he was killed in Memphis, 
Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King did a reflection on this particular reading from Luke's Gospel. And in summing up his reflection, he said, that priest and that Levite, they asked a particular question. They asked, what will become of me if I stop to help this injured man? But the Samaritan asked a different question. The Samaritan's question was, what will become of him if I don't stop? What will become of him if I don't stop? My sisters and brothers, there are so many bruised and beaten and battered bodies lying on the road. There are so many. They are black and they are white, they are Hispanic, they are Asian. They are men and they are women, they are children and they are aged, they are gay, they are straight, they are all people of God. And they are lying, bruised and beaten and battered on the road. And the only thing that stands between them and help is us. Us, the people who have been called to be laborers in God's vineyard. And we are called to respond no matter whether we believe that they hate us, no matter what their socioeconomic status is or their education level, no matter what neighborhood they live in, we are called to stop and pick up those bruised and beaten bodies in the road and to bandage their wounds and to show them mercy as God has shown mercy to every single one of us. Today is the day that we ask ourselves the question, What will become of all of those bruised and battered bodies if we don't stop to show mercy? What will become of all of us? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Standing as we are able, let us affirm our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. 